Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Frontline Club. Um, <clears throat> we're absolutely delighted to have um, uh, Mark here this evening. Um, before I um, open up the meeting, as it were, I just want to really try and set a little bit of the context. Um, I'm sure you're all aware that these are very challenging times uh, for Afghanistan at the present moment. Um, the, the, the statistics which come out almost every day, it would appear, um, are not pleasant to read. Um, we know from UNAMA, for example, last week that uh, civilian casualties are at an all-time all high, up 14% on a year ago. Um, we had the recent attack right in the center of Kabul, probably organized by either the Haqqani faction or Al-Qaeda, not entirely clear who did that. Uh, we know that the number of coalition troops killed in Afghanistan has almost doubled in the last year from 295 to 520. And we know that the Afghan uh, Taliban, whichever faction you want to look at, um, is resurgent and now has a presence in around 80% uh, of the country, um, shadow governors in 33 of the provinces, which is almost all of them. Um, there was uh, briefing notes prepared by the top NATO intelligence official in Afghanistan, Major General Michael Flynn, just been uh, made public today, uh, or leaked, uh, who he says that security incidents, which include improvised explosive attacks, ambushes, mortar, missile attacks, and so on, are routinely hitting 500 incidents a week um, in the second half of 2009. That compares with the weekly average of no more than 40 or so five years ago. Um, even in the winter, which is uh, traditionally a much slower season, um, incidents have not fallen below around about 300 a week, so it's still very dramatic. The Afghan government itself appears to be in crisis, um, almost in paralysis. Um, Karzai is having great difficulty, President Karzai having great difficulty persuading his parliament on his choice of ministers. Corruption remains a huge dominating problem. Um, the UN Office on Drugs and Crime produced a report last week which, which basically said that a quarter of the GDP was paid out by Afghan citizens in uh, bribes. As a, that's the only way that most people can get things done. And it takes up a huge percentage of the average Afghans, on average, on the, of the average Afghans' income. At the same time, there is, there, uh, there is in, some, in some quarters, there is at least, um, we, we, we have to admit it, there's a degree of optimism, um, possibly even certainty, that things are about to improve. General McChrystal certainly seems to be of that opinion. Um, and believes that the military fight in certain areas, and maybe in Helmand itself, can actually be won. Other generals may disagree. Um, those other generals are probably saying, and I think this is a, something which has been very noticeable in, in recent weeks, maybe the last month or two, um, suddenly we have a lot of people, a lot of military people, talking about the importance of directing the Taliban towards the negotiating table, and that, that being a conscious um, strategy. Now, this week in London, we have the um, international conference organized by the British government, which will be discussing all these issues and more. Um, amongst other things, it's been widely leaked that a reconciliation program of sorts will be put forward to persuade Taliban fighters to give up in exchange for a guaranteed income how that's precisely going to work and, and what it exactly means, uh, well, we, perhaps we can discuss that during this meeting. Um, we're extremely fortunate in having here tonight, and I, I should say, I mean, I think this meeting sold out in two or three hours. Um, as soon as the tickets went on sale, they went, so congratulations <laughs> to, to you, Mark. Um, you're, you're a crowd drawer, it would appear. Um, uh, Mr. Sedwell, until this morning, was our ambassador to Afghanistan. He still is, I believe. However, he now has um, another responsibility. He's been appointed today as, and he's just come from Brussels, um, as NATO's top civilian in Afghanistan. Um, and in that post, I'm not entirely sure, I hope he's going to tell us what he's going to be doing in that post, but I believe that part of his responsibility will be to ensure that the millions of dollars that are going into Afghanistan at the moment um, actually get to the provinces and are not siphoned off into the pockets of officials. 
So if, if I can start, and I, the format of this meeting, I, 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 I think I'm sure that everybody in this room, there are many people who want to speak and to ask questions, so I'm going to keep my questions to an absolute minimum. I just want to start things rolling, really. And after that, um, I will uh, open the floor to anybody who wants to speak. But if we could start, Mark, by um, just asking you to explain what exactly is your new appointment and how will it differ from the role of uh, Fernando Gentilini, the NATO, NATO civilian representative in Kabul at the moment? Well, Nick, thank you. Um, that's a hell of an introduction. Uh, um, uh, last time I was in here, I at least was a lot more relaxed than I'm feeling um, after that. Um, and I guess most of you are feeling about as relaxed as I did on that occasion. It's good to be here, and I'm, and I'm uh, uh, you know, pleased to see so many people taking an interest. In, the, in, in response to your first question, I want to come back to the point you made in your introduction. In response to the first question, in a sense, um, part of the answer arises out of events like this evening. Um, what we have to do in Afghanistan is ensure that we are making the political and civilian side um, uh, deliver alongside the security agenda, alongside the, the military side. Um, we have in NATO an alliance that's you know, uh, decades old. It's got a uh, sound command structure. The military uh, uh, alliance works in that way. You have unity of command. General McChrystal's in charge. And although it's com complex, because it is an international alliance, um, he, uh, in the end, is able to drive his agenda forward um, and put his plans into effect um, uh, through, through that. It doesn't exist that way on the civilian side. The civilian side is at best a coalition. It isn't really an alliance. Uh, individual nations have their own responsibilities. Some lead have lead responsibilities for cross-cutting issues uh, allocated by the G8. A few, uh, a few years ago, we took on the responsibility for counter-narcotics, for example. Germans, Italians took on others. And then, of course, you have in provinces individual nations, such as ours in Helmand, taking on responsibility for provincial reconstruction teams. The Germans, you know, mostly in the north, Italians and Spanish mostly in the West, ourselves, the Canadians uh, in the South, the Americans in the East. Um, so there's lots of individual nations, each driving forward their own, um, uh, th their own work to a, uh, essentially a common, uh, a common end, which is a stable Afghanistan, and a stable Afghanistan you know, meaning a, uh, you know, a safer world for all of us, but not really having that same cohesion, if you like, that you get on the military side. It is critical. We all know we're in a critical year. Uh, you could have said that pretty much every year since uh, the campaign started, and I suspect people probably did at the beginning of each year. But this year we know we are, not least because we know we have a deadline. Uh, President Obama uh, has made clear that he is going to start drawing forces down in July 2011. Uh, and what is less known um, is that uh, he, he, he will reconsider, and has and said this in various uh, interviews, and, and people in this room will know it, but not everybody watching will know it, has said in various interviews, he will reconsider, reflect upon, review the strategy at the end of 2010, early 2011, so basically a year from now, and consider whether the current strategy, the counterinsurgency strategy, is working, um, or whether we need to take a, a different approach. And of course, although it is an international coalition, it is very much in the end um, uh, you know, an American-led um, uh, an American-led effort. Um, and so, therefore, you know, the exam question at the end of 2010, early 2011 will be, is this working? Are we on course? Is this going to succeed? If it is, then I believe there will be a political consensus, not only in the United States but elsewhere, uh, to continue. You know, we won't have succeeded by then, but have we turned it around and have we redressed some of the, 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 the statistics you were talking about, Nick? Um, but also, um, on governance, on development as well, and, and I'll just come back to that point in a minute. Um, if not, then I think there will be a fairly radical relook at the whole strategy and whether we need to take a different approach. And people again in this room will know that uh, though those alternatives were considered by the U.S. administration as uh, as, it, as they reviewed the McChrystal uh, report from you know, th throughout the autumn. <coughs> Um, let me just set a bit of context for the London conference um, in order to stimulate um, thoughts and, and, and questions. There is no question. If you look, at, if you look at, across the, um, uh, the facts, if you like, security, governance, development, fundamentally security has declined year on year over the last four years. Governance has flatlined. Development and the economy has actually done quite well. Uh, but if you look at all the data on security, you can essentially pick any, pick any series of data, civilian casualties, coalition casualties, uh, the spread of the insurgency. They have spread from the south into the west and north in pockets. They've deepened their grip in the south and east. 
uh, British casualties, just to take that as an example, went from 30 to 50 to 70 to 100, in effect, uh, over, the last, over the last four years. Um, and one can always come up with explanations for each of those individual data series saying, well, this is because of this reason, this is because we're trying harder, etc. But there is no question that the security situation has deteriorated year on year over the last four years, and 2009 was the toughest year yet. Um, governance, you mentioned uh, corruption uh, and, and other difficulties. I think governance is a mixed picture. It has, in my view, some pretty much flat line. Corruption is, is clearly a very serious problem. Afghanistan is now, in effect, second bottom on the transparency index, although that's a perception index, so one does need to be slightly cautious about that. But there is no question that corruption is a huge, <coughs> is a huge problem. Um, people have to pay. Uh, as you say, a, 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 an unacceptable proportion of their income just to get the daily sort of licenses, if you like, out of government, vehicles, etc., driving licenses, whatever it might be, to, to license a business. Uh, and so that goes from that petty corruption of minor officials right the way up to the grand corruption that's linked with organized crime and the, and the drug trade. Um, the, the ability of, government, of the government to deliver services, particularly in the rural south and east, um, is, uh, is weak, um, and we have not developed that as fast or as effectively as we should. And you know, we have to understand that, that a lot of the problems in Afghanistan fundamentally arise from a lack of capability. Uh, and I don't believe that the international community has, has in a focused enough way over the past uh, few years, um, it enabled the Afghans to really raise their own government capability. Mm. The UK approach, as you know, is to try and put as much resource through government um, as we can to develop the government's own capabilities and increase the affiliation of the people to their own government. Um, that isn't the case with all other donors. Many others just go for projects that they deliver themselves with their own flag on them and inevitably therefore there are risks around whether those really connect with the needs of the people but also um, whether they actually build that um, that affiliation to their own institutions, confidence in their own institutions, and the capability of their own institutions. Uh, I hope we'll see that change, but that has clearly been an issue. So I think governance you know, is mixed, but, uh, but you know, there are some strong ministries, weak ministries, etc. I'd say overall it's flatlined. The one really bright spot, I think, in Afghanistan has been the economy. The development ministries are well led. Um, We've had a series of pretty good finance ministers. The current one, um, Minister Zakhawal, who will be here at the London conference, is excellent. Uh, and he's really beginning to impose a, a, a coherent approach on the development and economic agenda across government. Of course, Ashraf Ghani was the first finance minister, and people will be familiar with his uh, you know, very impressive uh, track record and many of the programs that were introduced in his time. But the economy has grown fast um, over the past uh, few years. Agriculture has picked up, very again, very well-led ministry. Some of the development programs, such as the National Solidarity Program, grassroots development projects out in the rural villages, you know, are state of the art and, and are good you know, compared to, com compared, um, to, to you know, any other country in the world, really, any other developing country in the world. So I think that's the picture that we, that we face, and that's the context for the London conference. What's the strategy and what's sort of my new job about? Well, my new job is about n not imposing, um, because you can't, but it is trying to um, lever, corral, enthuse um, uh, better coherence, better coordination across the civil and political um, agenda in support of or alongside the military agenda to improve security. The overall strategy, uh, again, people in this room will be familiar with it, but just let me repeat it, is to regain um, uh, the initiative against the insurgency, primarily a security, um, a security function. Um, uh, and that I think we will see some big differences in uh, this year, not only because of the surge of forces, you know, an additional 40,000 US and, and NATO troops coming in. The Obama administration has doubled the number of US troops in Afghanistan in, in a year, or will have done by the time they all arrive, from 50 to 100,000. Uh, you know, it's a very significant, very, very significant uplift. But alongside that is this intense embedded partnering that McChrystal has introduced, General McChrystal has introduced, with the Afghan forces. And so that means that security operations will have the punch and capabilities and flexibility that the ISAF capabilities can bring to them, but they will have an Afghan face on them. Mm. Um, and we will have Afghans and international forces operating together. Personally, I believe uh, that that will make a difference not only to the Afghan forces, but to the ISAF 
capabilities as well. If people are out on patrol and counterinsurgency, as people in this room will know, is you know, about being out among the population, then Afghans alongside international forces simply understand the environment they're operating in instinctively in a way that no foreigner in any environment uh, possibly can. So I believe, uh, and I know that General McChrystal, much more authoritative on this than me, uh, believes that we can regain the initiative against the insurgency this year, and I think we'll see some big operations to try and do so over the spring and summer. I think the second big area is to strengthen Afghan institutions, military and civil, uh, and that is about uh, both at the national but particularly the provincial and district level in the focus districts uh, to improve Afghan governance and we've got teams going out to try and help them build up their capabilities obviously also the Afghan security forces uh, but uh, enabling the Afghan state to compete directly with the Taliban the shadow governors you mentioned compete head-on on security and justice and exploit their advantage in the areas the Taliban can't compete, which is economic development and jobs. Uh, and those haven't been effective enough. I believe we can do that. And then thirdly, and this goes to the point you made about uh, reconciliation, addressing those political tensions, those political grievances that fuel the insurgency, whether they're at village, district, tribal, ethnic, and indeed even regional um, level. Uh, and it's always very difficult to tell, but probably about three quarters of the insurgency, maybe more, is not really hardcore Taliban. Um, in a sense, they're fighting with the Taliban rather than for them, uh, and they're doing so for a wide variety of reasons. Something like that number of insurgents, uh, we believe, fight within 10 or 15 miles of where they were born. It's, it's a, in many cases, it's a, it's a syndicate insurgency with a lot of local issues driving it. And whether or not um, the core Taliban are ever reintegrated into the mainstream Afghan political and economic life, those three quarters, if you like, of the insurgents have to be. Otherwise, whether the Taliban are there or not, we're going to have continuing instability. Uh, and uh, you know, that just means Afghanistan, at the very least, would remain contested, uh, contested space. Can, can we talk about that point in particular? Yeah. Um, the, uh, in, in the context of the London, London conference, it has been uh, leaked, I guess, that um, the, the reconciliation plan is going to involve some of the figure I've seen is $500 million over five years, um, with Pakistan playing a kind of mediating role between uh, negotiating on be, uh, bringing together the, the, the Taliban and the Karzai government. Is that roughly the shape of things? I think that, that, that probably adds a few things together and creates sort of, you know, adds two, two, two together and comes to slightly more than four, um, uh, if you like. Reconciliation is an important part of the London Conference, and, in, and if I can just speak briefly about the London Conference, mm. and then I'll come back to the specific point. The purpose of the London Conference is to take that agenda and essentially <coughs> pull it together and energise it over the next year. Commitments on the Afghan government side, commitments on the international, from the international community. The theme of it is Afghan leadership international partnership that's very deliberate this is the first conference which the Afghans are really setting the agenda for rather than essentially being in receive mode which has been the case in the past and we're trying to use this conference in a sense as a turning point in their capabilities um, uh, and it is essentially to try and set that agenda on on these issues security governance development over the next year to 18 months uh, followed up by a conference in Kabul later in the spring when we'll see more detailed implementation programs um, on the specific point of reconciliation, I'm not going to preempt the conference by um, sort of uh, announcing what I think are going to be the specific outcomes. Uh, you'll understand that that would get me into enormous trouble uh, with, uh, uh, well, with political leaders all around the world. And since I now, um, from today, have uh, 44 political leaders to satisfy not just one, um, I'm going to be cautious on that. Uh, but there will be some commitments in the communique uh, announced tomorrow um, about uh, reconciliation, a program supported by a fund, so an Afghan-led program with a, you know, an, an internationally provided fund. I don't, I don't think one should um, uh, uh, overdo this idea of mediation, the, whether the Pakistani government will be involved, the Saudi government, other various um, candidates to, to mediate, because I don't think we're at that stage, is my own view yet. Um, and, I, and whether we ever will be, I don't know. I'm, I'm probably uh, personally slight, slightly at the cautious end of this. Um, uh, my, own, my own view is that we should really work on um, that 75%, that three quarters, if you like, of the insurgency first and try and address all of those issues that underpin a lot of the insurgency um, before we necessarily need to think 
um, about uh, a, a political arrangement with the core Taliban. But in the end, that's not my decision or indeed the decision of anybody in the international community. It's a decision for the Afghans. Frank, and, Frank. And, and they'll need to they'll need to make that judgment. They have their own contacts. Um, yeah, there will be various candidates to be mediators, some from the region, some from outside. Um, you know, those various candidates, I think, need to play this fairly cautiously and allow the Afghans to, uh, to, 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 to run with this. Where we've got ahead of the Afghan government in the past, it's gone wrong, as we know. Yes. And we mustn't make that mistake again. Well, do, you, do you think that there is uh, reasonable evidence that the, there, there are a substantial number or even a faction within the Taliban that is willing to negotiate with the Karzai government? I think it's very difficult to tell, Nick. Um, you, you see reports, um, some in the media, one gets you know, occasional hints of intelligence and so on. It's just very, very difficult to tell. Um, and of course, it's also very difficult to tell whether any feelers that are out there are genuine or whether they're simply trying to buy time, lie low, and hope to divert people's attention. Um, uh, and, and I just simply wouldn't claim to, to be confident of the answer to that. Do you, do you and think I'm that very sceptical of those people who, claim, who, who say they are. Do you think the Afghan government itself is open to the idea of negotiating with the Taliban? I mean, the Taliban has made it clear publicly on many occasions that they will have nothing to do with Karzai and they want to see him out of the country, etc., yeah. etc. Cetera, et cetera. But, but uh, I mean, I think the, the Afghan government is, Karzai himself, of course, has said, excuse me, on a couple of occasions, you know, I will give safe passage even to Mullah Omar if he's willing to come and talk. Now, mm. that inevitably has an, yeah, an element of political theatre and rhetoric about it, but it is sincerely meant um, in, in that he, I mean, you know, yeah, and I deal with him quite a lot, he fundamentally believes um, in, in trying to bring all the Afghans back home. He is genuinely a big tent politician. Um, and you know, would like you know, peace. I mean, he, he sees it not as reconciliation or as a as, as a process. He sees it as a. He, he talks of peace, um, and and it's a slightly you know, it's a different perspective to the one that we might see it through from from outside. So I think he genuinely would like that if it if it were available. Um, whether individual members of the senior leadership of the Taliban, whether the collective leadership of the Taliban think the time is right or are willing to do it, I think is, as I say, it's very difficult to tell. I'm simply not confident of what their intentions are. And I think we have to all be very cautious not to overinterpret the signals we get. Can I just ask you, why is this conference happening now in London? Um, well, as usual, there's an element of coincidence um, uh, and, and good fortune about it. Um, the, the, there was a strong feeling um, after the difficulties of the last year, not only the security issues that we've discussed, um, but also you know, all of the controversy around the election um, and everything else, that we needed to re-inject momentum, political momentum, into this, as well as the, the prospect of, of, of military progress. Um, and uh, there was a lot of talk around this idea that there could be the first, the first for the first time, President Karzai's second term, we could have a conference in Kabul, um, and that, you know, that would be a visible sign of Afghan leadership uh, with the international community coming in behind, and everybody um, supports that idea. It was also clear, however, that given the practical challenges and the difficulties of forming a government, putting together a new program, and so on, um, for the second term after, after the election, uh, that that would take several months, and, and Kab the Kabul conference will probably take place in late spring. Um, uh, we don't know the exact timing yet. And again, there was a general uh, view, I think, that that was too late to wait. We couldn't just allow another few months of political drift, mm -hmm. so we needed to re-inject some political momentum and therefore another conference in advance. Um, putting together the international community at this stage of the year was an opportunity, as I say, to re-inject that momentum um, uh, alongside what we hope will be the security progress that we'll see on the ground. Okay, according to a leaked um, draft of the conference communique, which appeared in the Daily Telegraph, you may be familiar with that, um, British soldiers are likely to have a presence in Helmand for the next five years. Is that realistic? Um, I guess I could just simply say I never comment on leaked documents. <laughs> um, the, uh, there was a meeting today, which I wasn't at because I was in Brussels, um, where they were discussing with international, with the key international partners, uh, the, the communique. So the communique has gone through various revisions, and I guess we'll, get, we'll come in in final form, or will come out in final form tomorrow. I haven't seen the latest revision of the communique. Um, but I've been, I mean, I've said on the record myself, I think we will have troops in combat um, in those sort of combat roles for three to five years, and then we will see them move into 
um, you know, hopefully within well within that time we'll see more and more mo of, of our troops moving into um, uh, mentoring and then and then training roles gradually if you like coming out of the front line and and into almost the classroom um, I think we'll have uh, troops in Afghanistan NATO troops in Afghanistan uh, and, and that will probably include British troops for 10 to 15 years in uh, I mean the, you know, the British we sometimes use the shorthand for the British one BMAT Afghanistan you know using the old um, uh, formula that we used in various places where we've had missions such as Kenya and elsewhere over over many decades and I think we will have a, a strong NATO presence involved in that over uh, over you know, over a decade or more mm. but we very much hope that within three to five years we won't have British soldiers tramping the fields of Helmand um, uh, at the kind of risks that they're facing now or, or indeed other uh, in, indeed other NATO troops um, it's important to understand that training and mentoring is not a safe job, particularly with this partner partnership uh, approach that General McChrystal is now taking, which is essentially putting the troops alongside each other in operations and you know, using that to develop the Afghan forces. Um, so although our troops will be in a mentoring role, essentially or are already, that mentoring role is still highly kinetic and very dangerous. Um, and I, and I think, therefore, there won't be a moment to which we'll say they're no longer fighting, they're now mentoring, and they're no longer mentoring, they're now training. That will be a spectrum through which they'll move. And we'll gradually see more and more troops, as I say, in you know, the ratios will change. Instead of there being three to one British troops to Afghans, it'll gradually move to one to one and then to one to three. And, and we'll gradually, the numbers of troops that we have essentially out there patrolling will, will reduce, and then, and then they'll be in safer roles over that period. Okay, I, I would like to open this up now, um, so please indicate, and we'll start with the gentleman here. Thank you. It's very interesting the perspective you have. You probably need to speak up a little bit. Uh, oh, no microphone. You need the microphone. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, my name is Michael Story. I'm nobody. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the fundamental question, though, is why? Why are we nurturing Afghanistan? I mean, I can understand why the British did it in the 19th century and why the Russians tried to do it uh, a couple of decades ago. But um, you know, having worked a little in Afghanistan myself, a little, um, I cannot see strategically why it's important to us. I understand the motivation of going after al-Qaeda in the early days. But it's, it's turned into a, a sort of self-serving, self-inflaming um, end game, as, as, you know, from my perception. And I don't know why. Why strategically is it important to your? Is, did you say 41? 40, uh, 44. 44. Your 44 um, supporters, hopefully. Thank you. I do one last time. Yes. Um, for now. A big question. Um, and, and I do think it's, 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 a, it's a critical one to maintain the cohesion of those 44. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's why, in a way, it matters, because, uh, or one of the reasons it matters as a question, because um, what I think, if you look at our public opinion here, but, but more widely across the, across the alliance as a whole, people uh, very strongly support and recognize the courage and professionalism of our troops, but they aren't sure why they're there. And that, I think, is the reason why public support is weak. Um, uh, you know, here and, and has and has fallen. So I think it's a it's a it's a question we have to constantly answer. Um, I mean, Afghanistan, for the reasons you say, is not a strate the strategic crossroads in a, in the way that we saw it ourselves when the British Empire and the Russian empires were competing in that part of the world in the you know, the, the first round of the Great Game um, 150 years ago. But it is it is in a strategic area, of course, um, and. Uh, its influence on Pakistan, its influence potentially on Iran, etc., you know, is, isn't isn't to be disregarded. So having a having a, an Afghanistan that is unstable and is a danger to the region does actually matter to us. I, I, I believe in the UK, probably primarily because of Pakistan, because of course, you know, um, in a sense, foreign policy and domestic policy uh, as it relates to Pakistan are essentially one and the same thing because of the very large community here and our historic links to the country, the nuclear arms, and all the rest of it. No one would dispute the strategic importance of Pakistan. 
Afghanistan. The other, the other issue is that Afghanistan has been the field on which regional powers of all kinds, again, including ourselves when, you know, during the imperial period, um, have uh, played out their tensions uh, with each other. And one of the reasons that Afghanistan has been unstable for so long is because um, a, a range of their neighbors have preferred an unstable Afghanistan to risking an unfriendly one, um, and one which might fall into what they would see as the opposing camp. Um, and so it, it matters from that point of view because it does it is part of a strategic reason and it could be one of the sparks that that could inflame that region. But I think I think one can step away from the geopolitics in a way, and, and, and you know, because we're, uh, in a sense you could make that case around a lot of countries around the world in which we don't have 140,000 foreign troops. Um, and of course we do need to recognize the reason that we went into Afghanistan uh, after 2001 was because of 9-11 and the Al-Qaeda threat. Uh, now you can argue about how well we managed that. Uh, personally, I think one of the reasons I'm upbeat or, or at least uh, confident about our prospects is because I think at last we brought our ambitions and um, resources into line and I don't think they have been before but we have essentially by increasing one and focusing the other um, but it, you know essentially you know, we're there now because we're there we're there because uh, we went in with uh, the intention to stabilize Afghanistan um, and we haven't we haven't achieved that goal yet uh, now my view is that we, owe, we do owe the Afghans themselves. There is a debt of honor to the Afghans themselves. We promised them that we would help them stabilize their country and they wouldn't be abandoned again as they feel they were after the uh, jihad as they see it against the Soviet uh, Union. Um, and if we walk away from them, then you know, they will feel betrayed and, and I think they would you know, have, uh, be, be justified in doing so. I think there is also another reason, one's always got to be careful about domino theories, but there is an element of truth in them, that the next vulnerable government, the next vulnerable state we spoke to and said, we'll stand beside you in resisting this threat, would, wouldn't believe us. Um, uh, they and might therefore be more inclined to compromise and reach an agreement with um, you know, an Al-Qaeda-based insurgency, uh, because they wouldn't believe that in the, in the end, the West, the international community, had the um, uh, determination to to see this through, so I think you can you can argue about whether Afghanistan. I mean, to put it as absolute crudest, almost, you can argue about whether Afghanistan is the right ground on which to be having this particular fight, this particular struggle. For various reasons, it is the ground that 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 we you know that, that has been chosen, uh, chosen by Al Qaeda and chosen by us to to deal with that uh, threat and then try and stabilize that country so it could no longer become a haven for Al-Qaeda uh, or other terrorist movements and not threaten Pakistan and the rest of the world. Having chosen to um, see, you know, see this through in Afghanistan, I believe we should see it through. Um, and I think that probably overrides the geopolitical reasons about the, the importance of Afghanistan itself as a country. Although there, are, there, are, there is a case to suggest that, for example, because of copper deposits, other natural resources, it is actually going to become quite an important country. But that, of course, isn't the reason that we're there. We're there in the end uh, because we said we would see this through. And in my view, we have to. Thank you. there. Um, Michelle Rogers, former Kabul resident. Um, I've got two I'm questions. Sure. Hi, Mark. Two questions. Uh, yep, sure. Uh, tied in with economy and security. Rumor has it uh, 2009, as we all know, has been a hard year. And we know that the average Afghan earns about $2.50 a day, whilst the Taliban are paying them $15 a day to join their troops. I am better for about two months with the Sea Sticker program out in Host Province and got to meet a lot of different uh, American military there. And they have one major issue, which is we have this training and mentoring program. We bring them into the wire effectively, particularly the special forces. The American special forces are training the Afghan commandos, yet they're being hit far more often and sustaining far more uh, fatalities and injuries than they ever did before the program, because they now have this belief that there's a I guess you can call them double agents. The military, the Afghan soldiers come in because they get a decent pay from the Americans, but they can also still stay true to the Taliban, their true religious beliefs, and earn $15 a day. So there seems to be this terrible, I, I guess, catch-22. I work for the Taliban, get paid 15 bucks. Then I work for the uh, American army, and also the Brits are doing C-sticker, and earn good money, get trained well, 
and get to succeed in, in, in killing what they see as the uh, invaders of their country. I mean, it's a difficult position for the British and American military. The, the sea sticker program doesn't seem to be working. So, sorry, can I just ask, what is your question? The question is, why are we entering the sea sticker program when it doesn't seem to be working? There's an increase of fatalities and injuries within the armed forces since the program started. It's not always in the press, but it's definitely happening. Do you want to come back on that briefly? Sure. Um, I mean, having not embedded in Khos, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm cautious of getting into this because you probably know more about the subject, this particular subject, than I do. Um, and, but I think if you look at the overall data, there is, there is, no, there is anecdotal evidence, but very little um, broad-based evidence to suggest that, you get a, that, that we get a lot of people essentially um, switching from the armed forces, the police and the army, trained by us, into the insurgency. There's, there's, you, you hear stories about it, but there's very, very little evidence. Uh, there's very, very little evidence of it. Um, and that's partly because, and is one of the problems, that they don't, the, the representation of the southern Pashtuns in the armed forces is, uh, is very low. Now, that is a problem because, okay. exactly. <clears throat> uh, that is a problem because, of course, you, you need armed forces that reflect the ethnic balance of the country, um, and you know, there, there, are, there are issues of affiliation and loyalty there. But equally, it doesn't, you, know, you, you get the flip side of the, of the point you're making. Um, I mean, actually, the C sticker program, you know, I, th I think, again, has not achieved everything it should have done. It's now been reconfigured into the NTMA, nation, NATO training mission, Afghanistan. Uh, so it's got a broader remit, will include the police, includes the police more effectively now than the army. And I think if you look at the training, um, the, the army has progressed reasonably well uh, over the past few years. The police haven't really progressed because they haven't had the resources put into them. And recruitment and so on hasn't been disciplined. Uh, uh, but where they have been taken out, uh, there's a program called the Focus District Development Program, where police forces have essentially been taken out for just a matter of weeks training, I mean, a few weeks training, um, uh, and, and been replaced in the districts during that period and then gone back in again. We've, what we've seen in Helmand, for example, is a very significant rise in the confidence of the population in the police and, indeed, in the proficiency of the police. So training does make a difference. So I don't think I, could, I would agree with you that the C-Sticker hasn't really hasn't really worked. You can always find anecdotal evidence, but I don't, I don't think the premise of your question that the people, there's this recidivism, if you like, from the forces into the Taliban, there is really widespread evidence of that. Okay, thank you. There's a gentleman at the back there. Yep. After, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Nicholas Meller. Um, one, of the, one of the challenges that you, you mentioned in your introduction was really the coordination of aid. And today we had a conference of the civil, civil society, and one of the biggest concerns there was with the acceleration of the military effort, there will be even more greater pressure to use, to, to, to blur the distinction between development and what the military are doing, um, which would um, potentially undermine a lot of the goodwill that a lot of the development has has um, has created so far, and there was major concern among civil society about that. How would you reassure civil society, and how would you help to improve the coordination of aid? Um, uh, let me do the second half of that first. The, the, I mean, on the second half of the question, I should say that al although I have a role in that in my new task at, uh, uh, with ISAF and NATO, of course, in the end, we're all operating under a UN mandate in Afghanistan, uh, and the leadership of the international community really sits with the, um, with the UN. So I don't want to overestimate my own um, importance, although I'm sure I'll find an excuse to do so at some stage. Um, uh, the real issue, of course, is about the coordination made by the Afghan government. Uh, and that has also improved, but I think that's something on which we need to work very uh, closely over the next year. In terms of the, the, sort of the, the first half of your question um, about this uh, military-civil balance and the overlap um, between the two, in a sense, it's not about reassuring civil society um, about whether uh, the civ civilian effort is in some sense being tarnished by its association with the military effort because the constituency that matters is not us and it's not civil society, it's the Afghan population and whether we're really delivering for them. And I think we have to look at, Af we have to look at Afghanistan. It, you know, it, it, 
you know, one can oversimplify and one can you know, overcomplicate. But um, broadly speaking, there are like, you know, really two zones in Afghanistan, the south and east. Uh, the priority is stabilizing those. They're, they're facing a serious conflict. They're facing uh, deteriorating security. Uh, there isn't still massive support for the Taliban. Even in those areas, it's probably about a quarter, nothing, nothing much more than that, um, less than 10 percent countrywide. Um, but in those areas, the priority is stabilization. And, that, and therefore, the uh, civilian effort, the development effort, the civil effect, if you like, needs to focus on that, delivering the immediate benefits that people need to see from their government to actually believe they have a government um, that, is, that is worth supporting. And that, as I was saying earlier, means competing head on with the insurgency and the shadow governments uh, that Nick was talking about um, in terms of security and justice, uh, you know, being uh, as quick, um, fairer. Uh, 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 as, as, as clean as the motorcycle courts that the Taliban set up um, uh, in, in justice, and I think meshing together traditional justice and traditional uh, village surers that, uh, that deal with disputes into the formal justice system is a huge challenge for us, but a really important one, and we mustn't try and impose uh, a Western system of justice on that society. Um, security is obvious. Um, and then jobs and development, and those may be jobs in very simple development projects of the kind uh, that I mentioned earlier, the National Solidarity Programme. If you look at the north and west of the country, um, although there, is, there are still security issues there and pockets of insurgency, um, if we can get the whole country to the stage that those are in, while the insurgency won't be over, we will have succeeded. We, because we'll no longer have an insurgency that threatens the fundamental integrity of the Afghan state, which is what we're facing right now. The, you know, if, if we have Kunduzes and places like that all over the country, they will be very unpleasant to be in. They'll be, de they'll be very threatening. There'll be terrorist incidents. But in the end, the integrity of the Afghan state will be assured. And in the North and West, therefore, we're dealing, in a sense, with, with Afghanistan as a poor country rather than a conflict-ridden country. Now, that's an oversimplification, but you'll get the distinction I'm drawing. And there, I think we can see more classic development aid uh, that, is, that is designed to address poverty and all of the social issues that go with poverty that, in a sense, are common to many poor countries at the same stage of development as Afghanistan. But in the South and East, the priority, in my view, over the next 18 months or so is stabilization, because we can't deal with poverty until we've reduced the conflict. Um, and, and I think all of us, military and civil, need to share that agenda and see ourselves as partners rather than worrying about uh, one side or the other um, having a particular uh, profile. And of course, one can turn the question around and think about the military criticism of the civilians um, you know, uh, uh, as well. I think we've got to do that in partnership, particularly in the South and East. Gentlemen here. Ms. Lady here, Ms. Lady there. Michael, Michael Griffin, interested observer. I know you never like to comment on leaked documents, but the, the publication in the New York Times today of Carl Eikenberry's comments, cautionary notes to Mrs. Clinton about um, the proposed surge which will take place this, this year will um, certainly have rung a few bells. Does that, my first question is, does that indicate a very, very deep level of resistance within the US uh, bureaucracy, particularly the State Department, if you like, uh, to the proposed surge? The second question is, among his comments, is the note, he notes the fact that there is a lack of leadership among the 44 countries um, in their civilian efforts. And he proposes that America becomes the lead player in that area. Do you think you're going to have a sufficiently large budget from these 44 member states to actually make a lot of difference, or are you going to end up a little bit like Tony Blair in uh, Jerusalem? <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope not. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I can't decide whether to be flattered or not by the comparison. Uh, um, I must admit, I've never put myself in his league, in, 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 uh, or indeed uh, in, in, in any in any uh, in any sphere. Um, I mean, on the uh, yeah, on the first point, uh, I haven't I haven't seen the New York Times story, so so I'm sort of commenting. I'm, I'm familiar with with essentially some of the background, but I'm not familiar with the exact story. But I'm assuming this was. Um, uh, uh, something that Carl Icahn sent in during the autumn, when there was That's this correct. intense debate within the administration Two about hours, about which way, yeah, about which way to go. I mean, the fact is there was an intense debate within the administration. Um, quite a lot of it um, uh, played out, um, you know, semi-publicly in Washington, as as of, often is the case. Although I have 
have to say I think this administration has been a lot more disciplined than, for example, its immediate predecessor. Um, probably its two immediate predecessors about, about that. But there was an intense uh, debate about was this the right strategy? Was the surge the right thing to do? Was pressing on with essentially what, what, the, what General McChrystal's approach is, which, which is his, you know, his innovation is not, in a sense, to have come up with a new approach. It's to have said, we're really going to do counterinsurgency the way the Petraeus manual, the way that you know, it's been done elsewhere. We're really, really going to do it properly for the first time rather than compromising it um, or uh, pursuing a more kinetic form of, 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 of uh, military approach as had been done in the past. So in a sense it's really meaning, it's the, it's, the, it's the intensification of that. There was a real, I mean, very live debate in Washington as to whether that was the right thing to do, whether they should put in more forces, whether they should go for you know, what was um, seen as, a, as an alternative, essentially you know, characterized as a counter-terrorism strategy, in other words, a much lighter touch um, with uh, attacks you know, uh, or punitive attacks if, if terrorist uh, facilities uh, you know, grew up, um, and they worked all that through. And I think Carl Eichenberg, I mean, Carl Eichenberg, I know I, I see him all the time, played an active role in that debate, and it was absolutely right for him as ambassador to, you know, to be going in and saying, right, you know, we need to, we need to um, think about the alternatives, and we need to consider is a surge in forces the right thing to do, and is the timing of that surge. Uh, the right thing to do, absolutely the right, you know, absolutely his job as ambassador. And you know, if I were, you know, if we were doing the same thing in this country, I would be sending in uh, you know, similar kinds of cables saying, okay, that's the military recommendation. Here are the alternatives. Let's just, you know, essentially test that recommendation to destruction. I think Carl would do that. Call. Second question. Um, on the uh, on the second half, um, it's. I mean, my job is not to um, build an empire. Uh, and spend the next year trying to aggregate to myself or, 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 or and indeed arrogate to myself all of the civilian resources um, and, then, and then direct them. Um, uh, that's not, that's not uh, uh, the way it should work. And of course, I'd, you know, what you would do, even if, we, even if that were a desirable objective, and personally I don't think it is, because I think you lose energy rather than gain it from people. But, but even if it were desirable, you know, you'd spend a year or 18 months just fighting bureaucratic battles over you know, who signed which check and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. I think my, you know, my job is to try and generate greater coherence, to leverage all of the national resources that are there and, and try and create unity of effort rather than unity of command. Uh, identify where the gaps are, identify the crucial um, things that need to be delivered in those provinces afflicted by conflict and in the district in particular at that level, which has been neglected, um, afflicted by conflict, and what are the key um, uh, the key changes that we can make and therefore in the West what should I be trying to persuade the Italian government and the Italian ambassador to focus their resources on? What should I be persuading the American ambassador to focus his resources on? Um, Etc. And that is what I think what my job is. So it's in, a, in essence if it's, if it's leadership, it's leadership from the back seat. It's back seat driving rather than trying to, uh, uh, trying to, to control everything myself and, that, and that's the basis on which I do it. So there won't be much budget? Um, well, ISAF, ISAF has a very substantial budget, and yeah, I'll be part of delivering and, and directing that particular budget. But there are huge resources if they can be delivered in the right way. Um, and it's, I think, not a question of trying to get hold of all of those resources and take control of them, because I'd have to build a bureaucracy to do so. It's essentially playing my part in trying to get those resources directed, because in the end, as I was saying earlier, it's not we shouldn't be trying to do this directly. We should be trying to do this with and through the Afghan government and getting their brand on any improvements that are there so that people see them delivering. They don't think this is some kind of you know, external gift, if you like, that will be here today and, and gone tomorrow. And I genuinely think that's the right approach. Thank you. There's a lady. Yes. Dev Robinson, BBC World Service. Ambassador, what will your approach in your post will be towards um, warlords? Um, for that, I'm really thinking of um, uh, President Karzai's reappointment of uh, Uzbek warlord uh, General Dostum. How will you, um, as a British ambassador, as, as a new uh, NATO civil representative, approach this issue? And uh, slightly related to that, how do you see Turkey's uh, efforts to, to bring a regional um, consensus to, to Afghanistan issue? 
Um, two, uh, two, again, two big questions. I should just say, by the way, um, I won't be doing both jobs, I'm relieved to say. Um, uh, so at some point in the next few days, I will stop being the British ambassador, um, and my successor, who will be named in the usual way, will, be, will come out in a few months' time. His, his, his arrival is, is being br brought forward by about six to eight months. Um, so I will just be the NATO um, representative um, from, from essentially next week, or really from today. Um, in terms of uh, warlords and power brokers and so on, I think uh, I mean, this is a really difficult issue, and I think we have to look at the way they're conducting themselves now. There, are, there is no question there's a whole group of people who have got a pretty awful history um, in Afghanistan um, and you know, who are responsible for you know, all sorts of human rights abuses from uh, you know, the deaths of, you know, I mean, in some cases, countless numbers. Um, you know, to, 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 the most, to the most appalling uh, abuses. And of course, many of those people sit, excuse me, in support of the government. And it is just worth remembering as we talk about, excuse me, um, reconciliation with the Taliban, that uh, we've got to be careful not to be making uh, hypocritical moral judgments and saying, well, one group of people are absolutely beyond the pale because of the way they conducted themselves, and another group of people are within the tent despite the way they conducted themselves. Um, what we have to do, I think, is look at this as you have, as, as we look at many other post-conflict situations, including you know, the one uh, closer to home, and you know, one shouldn't draw those parallels too far. Um, but uh, you know, the Prime Minister and Brian Cowan are dealing with exactly, you know, in a sense, wrestling with some of these issues in a different context right now. If we're going to bring conflicts like Afghanistan, civil conflicts, to an end, um, just as just has been the case elsewhere, that means some pretty unsavory characters have to be brought within the system. Because if you don't bring them within the system in some way, at least for a period, then you, you, you risk the conflict breaking out. You risk whatever fragile peace you build falling apart uh, again. Uh, and so there are characters within the system who, uh, you know, either informally or formally, you know, within the government or outside it, um, you know, who uh, you know, have, have got a, you know, a, a terrible list of human rights abuses uh, to their name. I'm afraid that is one of the hard choices I believe we have to make in a place like Afghanistan, as has been made elsewhere. Uh, now, future conduct has to be different. You know, if there, are, if there are, uh, is an agreement to draw a line under the past, then there have to be clear understandings about future conduct, and that applies to corruption as much as it applies to illegal violence and, and illegal armed groups. And you know, none of us would wish that to be the case. It, we, you know, I would wish it were possible to rebuild a new Afghanistan without um, you know, that, that history still being a part of the present. But I think you have to manage the old Afghanistan while you're building the new one. Otherwise, the risk is you never get to build the new one. I think that's true in most, uh, most post-conflict post situations. Um, and it does mean, as I say, some difficult choices, and they're really difficult for the Afghans themselves because they remember the history of that. And I forget the second question. Turkey. Sorry. Turkey. Turkey. Uh, well, I mean, Turkey is, a, you know, is an important regional power the only Muslim NATO country, um, and uh, has a long history in Afghanistan, and therefore must have a very positive role to play. And there are various regional initiatives um, uh, out there. Um, some look more promising than others. They, some move fast and then stall. Others, you know, others then catch up. Um, and frankly, any initiative, uh, uh, in our view, that helps to bring together all of the key nations um, in that part of the world, gets them talking to each other, gets them to start to uh, address some of their shared challenges and indeed potentially their shared opportunities, which is something we tend to forget about, but they do exist, um, you know, in our view is well worth supporting. That doesn't mean a particular architecture is the right one. Uh, it doesn't mean we should back one horse over another. There are other trilateral processes with others involved. Uh, but the Turks do have a positive role to play. They do have an important role in Afghanistan. They don't tend to um, aggravate some of the same sensitivities as a, uh, uh, as a, as a non-Muslim um, country trying to play that role does. Equally, of course, there are sensitivities because they have their own national interests um, and they have some difficult relationships with countries of that region. So they have a, quite a difficult course to, to navigate. But from the perspective, I think, of NATO as a whole, um, with speaking with my sort of new job in mind, but also with my old job in mind from the UK, um, we're very much uh, you know, uh, uh, behind the Turkish efforts to move that kind of process forward. Of course, some people might say there's a connection between Dustin's rehabilitation and Turkish um, <laughs> activities. <laughs> Let me. Uh, there's a lady over there. <clears throat> 
put a hand up. Ambassador, good evening. My name is Fatima Ayub, and I work with an organization called the Open Society Institute. Um, and two areas that we focus on, particularly in Afghanistan, have to do with civilian protection and detentions policy. So I look forward to hearing some of your thoughts about how NATO can improve um, civilian compensation measures when there's been injury or death to Afghan families. Um, but more fundamentally, my point is one about accountability in Afghanistan. Speaking frankly, every couple of years, um, Afghans feel like the international community is rediscovering the solution to success in Afghanistan, right? So um, the ANDS and the London Compact was the last manifestation of it, an Afghan-led effort to coordinate civilian and military enterprises in Afghanistan. It fizzled out within three years. And the question a lot of Afghans have is just where did that go and who do we ask about that? Um, and it, for me, the question comes up again when we talk about um, the future of Afghanistan and trying to work with Afghan partners. And I agree with you completely that the Afghan government has to clean up its own act and that they should be at the forefront eventually of the security initiative as well. But I find it very hard to accept when you have efforts like um, community defense initiatives, for example, where, uh, w which are managed by US Special Forces and which deal with setting up effectively militias to uh, fight against insurgents in rural communities, or something like now that we have the Reintegration Trust Fund, which actually has now a billion uh, dollars in it, uh, according to latest figures. And my question is, is that these may be good ideas. They may or may not work. But more often than not, they don't work. And we're not the ones who have to live with the consequences of that it's really Afghans and Afghan communities. So who do we hold accountable when these things um, don't quite go right? So I'd appreciate your thoughts on that. Um, I think we have to, I mean, I think we genuinely have to hold all ourselves accountable. I don't, I don't quite agree with you that the ANDS just fizzled out. Actually, the ANDS, the Afghan National Development Strategy, is still the basis on which, in particular, the development aid is is being managed um, in Afghanistan. But I, I do take, I mean, I take the point about, I think your fundamental point is, uh, about, you know, uh, uh, initiatives um, and different directions and so on is a fair one. Um, I mean, in a sense, the answer to, the, to that question is one that the historians will have to address, and it's difficult to do so from the perspective of still being in the midst of this. Um, my own sort of instinct on that is that, uh, fundamentally, our ambitions and our, and our resources were out of line. We had uh, grandiose and sometimes skewed ambitions, uh, and we didn't resource them properly. Uh, and therefore, inevitably, we were going to be disappointed. Uh, and of course, a lot of those resources ended up in the wrong places as, you know, for the reasons we've discussed already. I genuinely think by focusing more now and by increasing our resources, I think they are pretty much now aligned. And that's why I think we have the opportunity now to, 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 to get this right. In terms, of, in terms of accountability and in terms of you know, various issues, I, I won't pick up every point you raise because there isn't time and other, other people may wish to bring up community defense and so I'm very happy to answer questions about that. But in terms of these various initiatives, one of the things that I know that Kai Ida, uh, the UN uh, Special Representative, um, gets frustrated about is at international conferences in the past and in international meetings, each foreign minister comes up with his favorite idea for what the solution to Afghanistan is or what the project is to, uh, you know, that is going to make a difference. Um, and he gets very frustrated when he says to them, so somebody says, you know, we need to develop the civil service. Yes, absolutely, we need to develop the civil service. You need a sort of civil C sticker, if you like, to, to, to go back to an earlier question. There is a civil service institute that's turning out its first graduates this year, and yet, and yet you know, there is a tendency of countries to wish to put their brand on something new. Uh, and I know Kai gets very frustrated by that, and he's, and he's right to do so. I think the only answer in the end can be that we have to empower, genuinely empower, the Afghan government themselves. And by empower, I don't just mean allow them to take the lead and set the programs, but actually provide them with the capabilities to do so. It is simply no good you know, saying, we're going to chuck you in at the deep end with this enormous burden. Um, and expect you to get on with it and blame you when it goes wrong, because that isn't fair accountability. So we have to equip them with the means to do so. I think we're seeing some very capable ministers now who are genuinely leading this development effort. And I hope one of the things we'll get out of London is a commitment to uh, build on the Afghan agenda and support the Afghan agenda rather than 
coming up with the latest bright idea of the moment um, uh, ourselves. And then in terms of accountability, the issue for me is in a sense what's behind your question, which is it's, the, 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 the issue should not be between uh, the, the commitment or, or accountability between the government of Afghanistan and the international community, but between the government of Afghanistan with the international community behind it and the people of Afghanistan, holding them genuinely accountable, and indeed us genuinely accountable, uh, for, for what's delivered. And that, I think, we just have to look at the effects on the ground. Gentleman here. And you. Uh, Najib Larvazak, freelance journalist. <clears throat> My question is about the reconciliation. The London conference is, I think, uh, mainly b based on reconciliation of Taliban, and uh, if I'm right. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, this reconciliation had been tried by the Soviet Union, and which they had a bigger program compared to NATO's one. And also, it was tried, you know, still, you know, going on by Kazakh government and uh, hitting. Uh, by Azra Sebratla Mujaddidi, the Speaker of the Hapa House. And uh, some of the groups that, when I was there, reconciled, reconciled more than 10 times. They were given money. They you know, just went back and came and went back and came. Is that not you know, paying money to reconcile? Is that not corruption in itself? And uh, is it not like throwing good money after bad? And, and the second question is, I mean, you know, you tried everything, the international community tried everything. Is that not the time to get uh, Taliban's leadership or insurgents leadership to come and talk instead of, you know, waiting and try, you know, trying other stuff, you know, before getting tired and, you know, you will do that, you know, probably in two years time anyway. Thanks. Uh, thank you. I mean, just, just to, um uh, uh, just on the first, the very first point you made, the London Conference is not just about reconciliation. It's one of the uh, elements that we hope will be featured, uh, but there's a whole range of issues. We are looking for commitments on uh, the, the growth and development of the Ash Afghan National Security Forces, both targets and, uh, as, as a big part of that, gradually um, going through this transition, this transfer of uh, security responsibility to the Afghan security forces, district by district, province by province, over the next few years. Commitment that President Karzai made in his inauguration speech. Development and government's commitments, particularly on corruption, as, as Nick was mentioning earlier, and indeed some commitments um, uh, on improving the regional, uh, regional security and stability and the international framework um, uh, as well. So it is broad-based as well as covering the reintegration reconciliation issue. But you're right to point to some of the flaws in the way that reintegration, reconciliation has been done uh, in the past. President Carter was asked about this in his BBC interview with John Simpson the other day, and you know, his answer was it wasn't properly resourced in the past, and that's the reason it didn't work. Now, I think that's a fair point, although I think it's more complicated than that for the reasons you point out. And what we have to do is make sure that any programs that are designed to bring back in, um, as he calls them, disaffected compatriots, um, don't uh, 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 you know, d don't contain within them those risks that you point to of recidivism, of people just you know, rotating, uh, rotating around. I think part of that is dealing with this issue I mentioned right at the beginning, um, which is some of those political tensions and grievances that exist at, at essentially at all levels. There are uh, various tribal groups, various communities that for, for one reason or another were excluded and have been excluded from political and economic power and are, and are therefore disadvantaged compared to others. That's partly in terms of recruitment into the police and army. It's partly in terms of their representation on district councils, provincial councils with the, you know, the, the, the status and resources that go with that and in parliament and so on. Um, and you know, there are a whole range of issues that uh, follow from that. And inevitably, those groups are the ones from which the insurgency draws more of its recruits. Uh, and that's for the same reason that disaffected groups you know, in any society you know, drift out of the mainstream and some people drift into violence. In Afghanistan, if they drift into violence, of course, you know, it, has, you know, it has sharper effects because of the availability of a, of a network to, uh, to essentially to, to, to leverage, to multiply that, multiply that violence. So I think. Uh, it isn't just a question of a reconciliation program. My own take on this is that if reintegration and reconciliation works, an awful lot of it will be invisible to us. An awful lot of these young men will just be quietly reintegrated into their own communities by their own 
elders, their tribal and village elders, uh, by their own communities without anybody noticing. They will simply quietly put down their weapons and go back to normal life. And that will be partly because we're providing the development and employment opportunities for them to do so and making those conditional upon communities saying, right, your sons mustn't fight for the Taliban. And there are ways, we think, of achieving that so that we're putting genuine community pressure at the grassroots level and, uh, on and creating the right incentives at the grassroots level rather than just having a, you know, a branded program, which is, in a sense, again, a rather essentially rather Western approach to this. I think we have to make this, as uh, Graham Lamb, the, the, the British general who's leading this effort in ISAF, calls it Afghan DNA compliant. And I think, I think that is a very important point. But it was interesting you talked about the risks of reconciliation and then talked about talking to the Taliban, uh, because in a sense these are two sides uh, of the same, uh, potentially two sides of the same coin. As I said earlier, and I won't go through it again because of time, um, I do think we need, you know, the insurgency is a complex phenomenon. Uh, there are these core hardline elements of it um, who are determined to overthrow the Afghan state and return it to um, the, uh, the situation that it was in before, before 2001. Now, there are some indications, as you were asking, I think Nick and one or two people have suggested, that they may have a softer agenda than that now. Um, I, you know, I think that's to be proven. Um, I suspect it would appear softer and then two years after we'd gone it would flick back and look just as awful as it did uh, in the late 1990s and we have to be very cautious uh, about that. But I think we can make real progress with in a sense this, this almost social insurgency that probably three quarters of the insurgency represents and it is you know, that, type, that, that phrase Karzai used in his inauguration address of disaffected compatriots I think is quite a good phrase because I think that describes it well. They're disaffected rather than hardline ideologues and if we can address that disaffection then you know, we won't bring the insurgency to a complete end. There'll still be an awful lot of threats but will it still be strong enough to threaten the integrity of the Afghan state. And if we can achieve that, then we're well on the road to success. So I, th I think that's the approach that, that we ought to be taking. Will President Karzai ask for the lifting of the UN ban on some of the people, the 144 Taliban is that are on that list? He might do. Certainly the Afghan government are considering that uh, and are considering some of the names on that list. Um, and as you know, Kai Ida suggested that we should do that as a confidence-building yes. measure. Um, and I think you know, the, British, the British point of view uh, on that is that we, you know, in principle, support it if the Afghan government are very clear that that's what they want to do and they have, you know, they have, uh, they have a good case uh, for doing so. Other governments are, are more cautious about it. Um, uh, you know, again, you know, it, it would be, I mean, I think Kai's probably right about this. It's a, it is saying to them, OK, we'll, we'll make you, um, uh, you know, we'll make a gesture. Now let's see whether you are really willing to take it up. And in a sense, calling their bluff, I think, is what's behind his mm. proposal. I think that's worth, well worth looking at. OK, thank you. Lady here. Hi, my name is Sandra Kaduri. I worked at the embassy in yes, Afghanistan indeed. for two years. And last year, I also investigated electoral fraud for the Election Complaints Commission. Um, so it just was a question, is there going to be a new UK approach to the government and to dealing with President Karzai, who still seems to be in denial that there was any electoral fraud last year, who's still appointing ministers to the cabinet who have been accused of corruption, um, who hasn't really prosecuted drug traffickers to the highest echelons? And, you know, what, what can the UK do more to, to, I don't see the possibility of change in the future. Um, and was there perhaps going to be a way to dilute the powers of the president, reopen the constitution? Um, we're just a bit depressed about looking forward when there seems to be no vision, a lot of moral fuzziness really what, about what's right and what's wrong in that country. The Taliban policy also seems a little bit worrying in that, um, you know, the, the, the guy who blows up 20 Afghan police yesterday is the same guy who you may want to forgive tomorrow and give $200 to reintegrate. Where's the clarity in all this? Um, uh, conflict of this kind, civil conflict, uh, often lacks clarity. Uh, and of course, if you look very closer to home at uh, you know, bringing the peace process in Northern Ireland, and again, one shouldn't overdo the parallels, but it's, it's, a, it's an instructive lesson. We did precisely that. People responsible for atrocities 
within you know, these islands and, uh, and uh, uh, an organization that didn't really threaten to overthrow the entire state, we decided you know, we had to make some difficult choices. And, 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 and I think you know, the same applies you know, in, in most post-conflict situations. Um, uh, if we're able to get to the post-conflict and not just carry, have the conflict carry on. Um, and the, as you say, the, the people who have been responsible for, the, for these attacks, there are people, as we were asked in a earlier, uh, as I asked in an earlier question, who were responsible for worse human rights abuses, many, many more thousands of deaths uh, during the Civil War. Uh, and you know, they are now part of the system. That's probably just inevitable. So I think clarity, if you're looking for clarity, um, uh, Afghanistan is probably not the brief to be, to be, uh, to, to, to be working on. Uh, because they, you know, it is complex and it's, and it's difficult. If it was clear, we'd have solved it by now. Um, in terms of your question about uh, you know, the, the, the government and the capabilities and so on, um, I mean, I think it's wait and see. Uh, now, that doesn't mean we're just passive wait and see, but we did get from President Karzai some clear political commitment in his inauguration speech to tackle many of the issues you talk about. Uh, he made further commitments on corruption at an anti-corruption conference which he convened. We'll see more tomorrow. Um, and uh, as I said, and indeed the NATO Secretary General said today when we were asked this question, you know, we expect those commitments to be honored. Uh, and, we, and, and the support of the international community is conditional on those being honored. Um, the cabinet, well, you know, the uh, you know, cabinets are always mixed. Um, uh, I did pull the leg of one of our ministers uh, and said to him, are you absolutely going to tell me that every British cabinet that you've known has had um, complete stars in every job? And he just burst out uh, laughing and, and we changed the subject. Um, uh, now, you know, there are, yeah, I'm not going to give a character reference to every single member of the Afghan cabinet, but I think if you look at the core ministries that really matter, uh, interior, defense, finance, agriculture, etc., cetera, um, there are some very strong ministers in there, and those are probably the best set of ministers that, 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 that we've had. I don't think, I mean, you can get into the question of constitutional reform and whether there should be a different system. My view is actually that's probably a secondary issue and would be a distraction at the moment. Um, the, uh, having, a, having strong ministers who are willing to work as a, work as a team and deliver the government agenda, you should actually, we should actually see some improvements. And what, again, we've tended to do in the past is because the only place where decisions have been able to be made is the presidency itself, then you know, President Karzai has been completely overburdened with decisions that you know, almost no government sh machine should be remitting to the center, let alone one that's as immature as Afghanistan's. Um, and therefore, by having more powerful and more capable ministries, I think we address some of those issues that you're talking about. But you're absolutely right to point to the risks. Um, uh, you know, this conference, the conference in Kabul, the actual delivery on the ground, um, a more conditional approach to international support, but, but a conditional approach that also offers the opportunity for more aid to go to the Afghan government to build their capabilities, feels to me like the right kind of package. But, but yeah, we do expect those commitments to be honored. Thank you. Gentleman in the middle there. Then go on. And then you. Thank you. Um, Taj Mustafa from Hizb Tahrir, an organization which has a presence in Afghanistan. And um, in advance of your London conference, we're actually launching a report tomorrow on Afghanistan. If anybody's interested, I've got some copies with me. Since 2001, um, as has been pointed out several times in this conversation so far, corruption, drug production, instability are up. The idea that those who have presided over the last eight years, NATO, the US, UK government, who have lost moral authority and credibility, the idea that they are in any position to chart a way forward would be laughable if this were not such a serious issue. They are not. And I think high time that's recognized and the colonial powers left Afghanistan, left the region, and let people in the region decide their own political destiny, rather than recycling old solutions, as we've heard so far today, and trying to impose from the outside. Thank you. Do you want to come back on that, Mark? Or? Yeah, I mean, just just briefly um, on that. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I won't. I won't. You know, it's obvious. I don't. I, I'm not going to agree with the, the 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 point that you've made. We're there under a UN mandate, um, and we're there uh, with the clear uh, support and indeed at the request of the government of Afghanistan and the people of Afghanistan. And you know, we can, we can, and should be 
critical about um, what we've achieved so far and what's gone wrong. Um, and I think I, you know, I've tried to be pretty frank about that this evening, and I hope we are learning the lessons of it. And I know that uh, General McChrystal you know, has looked very carefully on the, uh, the security side. We're determined to do the same on the civilian side. Um, the, the, the problem is, you can say that we, we, we should or should not be the actors there, uh, but the fact is that we are, and we don't have the option uh, of saying, well, you know, if we want to get to the solution that we all want, which is a stable Afghanistan, then we wouldn't be starting from here. The fact is we are starting from here, and all of us have a responsibility both to redress the mistakes of the past and try and do our best for the future. But it is very clear that uh, the people of Afghanistan both want and need our support at the moment, the majority of them. Uh, if you look at the recent BBC, ABC poll, that's, you know, that is absolutely clear. So we are there with their consent, uh, and it is not any kind of imposition on them. And as I said at the beginning, the, one of the points of the London conference, but, but our approach more generally, is to try and build Afghan leadership so that we are responding to the agenda the Afghans themselves are setting and supporting it, rather than seeking to impose our own solutions from outside. That means partnership, it means coaching, it means building their capabilities, because that state was you know, essentially wiped out after the civil war in the Taliban period. Um, uh, you know, it, it isn't a simply, it isn't simply a, 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 a clear question uh, of that kind. But you know, we have a responsibility, I think, to see it through. And I think that's what the Afghan people want us to do. Thank you. Gordon. Mark, can I ask you a bit about the nuts and bolts of peace building? Um, you talked about development and uh, employment as drivers of stabilization. In order to get to that point, you've got to be able to hold territory or get territory, then hold it, and then protect it. And there's been some discussion about how that protection should be carried out, whether or not uh, there should be armed militias and so on. Can I ask you, is there a general agreement between NATO countries and within the American administration and with the Afghan government that a district by district approach is what's going to really be spearheading this whole approach. And, and, and what, what sort of um, ideas do you have on, on, on the likely success of that? Um, well, the short answer is yes. Uh, it, it does need to be focused at district level. Uh, and probably one of the lesser known issues in the past is that we haven't done that enough. You know, we've had provincial reconstruction teams operating at the provincial level and there hasn't been enough focus at the district level. And Lindy Cameron, who's the head of the Hellman PRT, um, who's now been there for about six months, has made this a big focus of what she's trying to do with you know, the British-led PRT in Hellman to really put more of our, not only uh, resources in the terms of programs, but more resources in terms of the talent and expertise down to the district level so that we are delivering there because that's where um, the, you know, the people really interact with their government. In a country like Afghanistan, you know, the stage of development it's at, central government is really a series of people on television or on the radio, more likely, um, and posters. It, you know, they don't really interact with them, but they do interact with their district governor, their district uh, councils and so on, and, and that is a big part of both the security and the governance development programs uh, over the next year, and I hope uh, to make it a bigger part of the civilian side, the governance and development programs. Again, building Afghan capability there, Afghan district support teams, dif sorry, district stabilization teams that we are supporting, not foreign, uh, not foreign ones. Do I believe that can work? Well, I do. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've served uh, most of my career in uh, various Muslim countries. Um, the last two, Afghanistan and Pakistan. And I, I mean, you know, one of the things where, in a sense, I almost agree with the, the previous question is that we've got to be very cautious about imposing Western solutions um, and seeing these countries through a Western perspective. Now, it doesn't mean we should you know, go as, so far as to say that, they're, you know, that, that you know, complete relativism or, or that we don't, have a, we don't have a view, but we do have to, I think, operate with the grain of the country. Um, and, and with the grain of the society in which uh, we're working. And one of the features of Afghanistan you know, uh, is, is that government really um, uh, only you know, really meets the people at that local and, and district level. Uh, as I said, the insurgency is largely local. Most insurgents are fighting very close to where they were born and live and their families live. Uh, and therefore, I think that approach you, will it succeed? Well, I think any approach that doesn't do that probably won't succeed. So this is the right one to this is the right one to to to, to pursue. 
yeah. I believe it's got a good chance of success. What about arming the militias? Should I do mm, very briefly militias? Yeah. The militias question because I know uh, others have asked about that. Um, uh, I, I can't remember. Somebody characterised this as all being special forces and so on. There are a, a range of models which are te which tend to have tended to be bracketed under community defence, Afghan public protection programmes. They've all got a different set of labels, and actually, the devil really is in the detail here. Are they armed militias that end up being predatory and oppressing their own, you know, the populations they're there pr to protect, or or are they actually part of? essentially a genuine community defence you know, led and organised by the community, drawn from the community and thus responsive to the community's needs. Um, the latter, I think, is a, uh, you know, has, a, has a significant role to play, particularly in the rural, rural areas. Uh, probably not just at village level, but clusters of villages, because individual villages don't have the critical mass to resist external threats, whether Taliban or, or, or criminal threats, whereas a cluster of villages, you know, four or five, half a dozen villages together, each still operating in their individual, individual villages, but having agreed to do it that way, or you know, at district level, um, uh, which, which would probably be more than that, do have the critical mass to do that. And it's important to remember the Taliban, the insurgency, is indigenous, and they're calibrating too. They aren't. You know, they also have to negotiate their way um, uh, you know, th uh, 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 through the local and uh, the very local politics. Uh, and therefore, if a series of villages decide they don't want the Taliban there, they can resist it because the Taliban are not prepared to simply impose themselves. Uh, unlike some of the foreign fighters who, who come in and who have a record of brutality. Um, so in terms of these uh, community defence initiatives, I think they have a role to play as long as they're organised properly. But clearly if they become an imposition, um, something that's in the control of a local warlord uh, that doesn't really arise from the community, isn't under the control of the community, then the risks outweigh the potential benefits. Okay, we are we are drawing towards an end now. So can I ask people? I, I'll take a few questions um, together, if you don't mind. Lady here, the gentleman here, lady here. If uh, Taliban is going to be included in government, um, as you say they might, um, what implications will that have for the future of uh, women in Afghanistan? Okay, gentleman here. My qu my question is similar. It, it's we will eventually have to negotiate with Taliban. What are we going to offer them? And, and particularly bearing in mind my own country of Northern Ireland, which you've, you've already talked about. Lady here. Okay. Thank you. Sure, you opened up by saying that uh, development is up in the context of security and corruption. Horrendous. What kind of development is up? What kind of optimism should we in the wider world be looking at? as a positive note to give us encouragement and an incentive to support the strategies that you're trying to undertake. Shall I do those three yes, quickly? Yes, please. Um, women's rights and indeed human rights more generally. Um, <coughs> I mean, just, just, to, just to be clear, I didn't suggest that the Taliban would re-enter government. I know others are suggesting that. I think I've, you know, I, I hope I've made clear, I personally take a rather cautious view on that if you like, the political deal as opposed to a balanced political settlement within Afghanistan. Um, but uh, in his interview the other day, President Karzai, I think, was pretty clear on this, that, uh, you know, that the, the, the red lines are respect for the Afghan constitution, um, uh, uh, no support for al-Qaeda, and giving up violence as a political tool. I mean, he, put, he uses his own words, but fundamentally, and of course, that will have resonances for the, for the domestic situation. Um, uh, those essentially are the, you know, are the red lines. Now, you know, the, within the Constitution, the Constitution is absolutely clear on human rights generally and, and the, rights, uh, the rights of women. It is important, of course, to understand that the delivery of human rights and the delivery of women's rights, again, particularly in rural areas, in poorly educated uh, communities is way short of the aspiration the Afghan constitution sets out. And that isn't only true in the south and the conflict areas, it's true right the way through the country. And of course, one of the issues in which I and others were engaged earlier this year were various pieces of legislation going through the Afghan parliament, which looked as though they were going to be retrograde for women's rights. So women's rights is going to be a big issue within Afghanistan for a long time to come, the actual delivery of women's rights, even if 
on the assumption that the constitution, you know, you know, the constitutional provision remains firm because there is a gap between delivery and delivery and and, and if you like that constitutional uh, guarantee. The right way to deal with that is the way that we deal with it in many other societies that are developing, where you know, across Africa, many other countries, you know, women live at disadvantage or under oppression, and that is through development, education, gradual improvement in prosperity, and and, you know, uh, and, and that is the way I think we'll gradually improve this in Afghanistan. So we shouldn't just see women's rights as an issue between the Taliban and the mainstream. It is it is an issue within the mainstream as well, and it's important that we don't uh, we don't forget it. In terms of the economic um, uh, question, and hopefully that in sense touches your question as, uh, as well. Sorry, what was? What, what are you prepared to offer Taliban? You're going to have to negotiate with Taliban. What are you offering them? Well, we aren't offering them anything. Uh, in the end, it's for the Afghan government to offer them, and essentially what they're offering them is a route back into legitimate political and economic life Listen, the moment, on conditions. Uh, it, it, at the conference at the moment, it's money. That seems crazy. Well, it's not. You know, that, that's a reintegration program to, to essentially address this question someone else was asking about, which is uh, to, to bring fighters out of the fight and get them into jobs and so on. It's not just money. You know, no, nobody is really talking about just handing over checks to individual fighters or individual commanders, although there may be an element of that you know, on a temporary basis just to get a ceasefire and get people out of, a, out of the fight. But in the end, the money has to go to getting these guys jobs, getting them educated and getting them back into the mainstream, which takes us back to essentially the development and stabilization agenda. And most of the money that is, uh, that is likely to be committed to reintegration and reconciliation would actually go through those mechanisms, things like the National Solidarity Program, which is a development program. So on, in your answer, what is the offer? Well, as I say, it's for the Afghan I government. I connected with Northern Ireland. Yeah. Had you offered money to the IRA, it wouldn't have got far. Well, uh, it, uh, as I said, we shouldn't drive the we shouldn't drive the we shouldn't drive. Sorry, we mustn't have a uh, we shouldn't drive we shouldn't drive the parallels too far. Um, uh, I mean, the difference being that people don't have jobs and so on. There, that's part of the reason that people are in the insurgency. But you know, the offer is essentially a route back into the political and economic mainstream into legitimate life where they can go back to their families, they can farm, they can have a job, you know, and they're not they're not outside. It's not. You, uh, the kind of political compromise that the first question um, uh, of that set was asking about. And of course, in the long term, it is that uh, international forces, once there is no longer an insurgency to, to address, will reduce and step back into a training and supporting role, not a combat role. And of course, that means we would no longer be out there fighting within the villages, which of course nobody, neither us nor the people of that area, want. But that's not part of a deal. That's that's the prospect for a peaceful Afghanistan that's that's out there. Um, in terms of the economic development, I mean, economic growth, for example, has been um, very strong. Now, you know, the, the uh, you know, it's it's double digit. Uh, it was double digit in two, 2009. I can't remember the exact number. Um, it's been six to eight percent uh, generally. Um, sorry. Why? Well, partly because of aid, partly because the private sector has picked up, um, uh, partly because there's been uh, there's been agricultural development, and uh, some of that's good harvests, and you know there'll be there'll be um, good years and bad years. But but just economic growth gradually has picked up, and we get we get very focused, particularly in the UK, on Helmand and the South because you know, that's where our forces are, and of course that's where the news organisations focus their attention. For those of you who ever go to Afghanistan, it is well worth travelling to Herat or Mazar Sharif and, and parts of the north, where you don't have HESCO barriers absolutely everywhere. You don't have guards uh, on every building, and you know, Mazar Sharif, for example, is a Central Asian city, you know, like many others, where you see economic activity uh, going ahead. And there is, there is, you know, that's the, that's the sense the, the opportunity that the south can, south and east can aspire to if the conflict ends, if they're stabilized, which again, in a sense, goes to the, goes to the previous question. But I mean, as you know, you know the, these are very overquoted statistics, but it's worth just registering. The number of children in school, in primary school, uh, including the number of girls in primary school, um, access to health care, all of those numbers have headed in the right direction and quite radically in the right direction over the past, uh, over the past few years. So I think there, is, there has been genuine progress. Mostly in the north? Um, variable. Um, but but I mean, every area is up, but obviously the, you know, it's variable. And, and of course, this goes back to this distinction between stabilization and development. You can't really address <coughs> Afghanistan as a poor country until we've addressed Afghanistan as a conflict-ridden country. And that's got to be our task for the next year um, or 18 months. 
that's probably a good point on which to finish. I think that is the point to finish. <laughs> um, I think you should show your appreciation to Mark, who's done a fantastic job.